It's a motor. Motor. Uh, very good morning, everyone. That was indeed an enriching and insightful session. A hearty thanks to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Padmaja Mishra, for being instrumental in setting up this Center for Excellence. Thank you to our mentor, Professor Jatin Nai, for uh, always guiding us and sparing his valuable time to speak to us. And of course, our coordinator, Professor Madhushmita Pati, without whose encouragement, this event would not have been possible. A warm welcome once again to all the participants to the first session of this two day webinar on life writing new perspectives by the Center of Excellence Ramadevi Women's University. It is my honor and privilege to welcome our guest speaker for this session, Professor Kaiser Ha. A very good morning, sir. After retiring from the University of Dhaka, Professor Ha is currently Dean Arts and Humanities. University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. Professor Huck is a recipient of the Bangla Academy Prize, the Sherwin W. Howard Award for Poetry, and the Distinguished Achievement Award for Creative Writing, South Asian Literary Association. He has eight poetry collections to his credit. Professor Huck, while pursuing his PhD, was a Commonwealth Scholar at Warwick University, UK. He was also a senior Fulbright scholar and last fellow at the University of Wisconsin, USA and a Royal Literary Fund Fellow at School of Oriental and African Studies, England. Professor Huff will speak on the uses of life writing for South Asians. Professor Huff, please. Hello. So please unmute your mic, please. We're not able to hear you. So Professor Huff, please uh, kindly unmute your mic. Right. It, yes. It does, is it working now? Yes, sir. You audible. You can begin. Oh, oh good. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jatin Nayak and uh, Professor Madhushmita, uh, for inviting me to this occasion, uh, to this wonderful seminar, uh, webinar. And uh, uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, this uh, should be a webinar rather than a, li a live, you know, face to face conference, because uh, I think uh, one effect that this pandemic is going to have is to make uh, this kind of virtual interaction more common. I think uh, already people are talking about radical changes in our economic lives as a result of this uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, I think our academic life is also going to change uh, in quite uh, perceptible ways because uh, I think we'll, uh, we are headed for a uh, sort of uh, an age of blending the virtual and the real. Uh, the two will go parallel. And uh, in the context of life writing, this is also very important because life writing, the, the term, even though it was coined in the 17th century, um, shortly after the term biography was coined, uh, has become popular only recently, really. I mean, it is, I must confess that it's not all that long ago that I came across the term life writing. You know? um, I think it is very much a 21st century phenomenon that the kind of uh, interest that is being generated now um, in the, and your center is, an, is a case in point. Then another centers at King's College you know, at Oxford uh, and uh, elsewhere in the world, in Australia, I believe, uh, are focusing on life writing. And I think this is part of a broad uh, change in uh, the um, literary scene, in, in the way uh, literature is uh, taught, studied, and explored. And uh, you, we can see this uh, change in the way uh, 
certain and the new terms are, become, are replacing old ones. I think uh, life writing is one because uh, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it is autobiography. It is a form of autobiographical writing. In fact, uh, the two words mean the same thing. And yet life writing seems to be to have a broader compass. It is a blanket term, a kind of hold all, where um, virtual modes of uh, leaving traces uh, can, can also feature. So um, hence uh, the importance of blogs, um, you know, um, even I, I suppose uh, um, videos, um, and uh, you know, writings online, even the Facebook posts, um, emails, because uh, emails have virtually replaced letters. And uh, in the past, of course, letters were a, an important form of uh, life writing. Um, now, emails, we, I, I used to think of emails as a rather ephemeral kind of communication. You just dash off something. You don't even check the spe bother to check the spelling and the grammar. You know, this is how people generally write emails. And yet, uh, there's at least one book um, which is a collection of emails. Uh, it's a, uh, a collection of emails exchanged by Bernard Henri Lévy, the French uh, philosopher, and uh, the French novelist Michel Houellebecq. So they debate and discuss various things through emails, which are subsequently collected and published. So this is a, this sort of thing can become it may become more common. In other words, I think the the, the uh, modes of expression have become uh, greatly widened as a result of the new technology and also uh, globalization, the economic changes which have taken place, plus the changes in the way we are approaching the whole subject of literature. Now, take up, say, uh, we have left the 20th century behind. In uh, Amitabh Ghosh's uh, new novel, Gun Island, which in a way can be seen as life writing because it is life writing that deals with a number of very interesting characters from. Uh, India, Bangladesh, and elsewhere. Anyway, there um, one of the young uh, uh, characters in the novel says to the uh, narrator, um, "You are still in the 20th century. Do you think we are in the 20th century now?" So it's, it, uh, I mean, it, and it suddenly made me realize that the 21st century is now 20 years old. And if you and we are due for uh, major uh, changes in our cultural life, just think of the 1920s and how revolutionary it was. It was there was when um, the the age of high modernism, and now what will our 20s, the 2020s, bring? And I think um, the kind of interest that is being generated by life writing is one of the aspects of the new 20s, the 2020s. And uh, alongside, you can see the, um, the, the, the use of uh, growing use of new terms like translingualism, literary translingualism. Instead of to write, uh, talking about um, uh, writing in a language other than the mother tongue. So it's, it, we are all translingual writers now. Um, think of um, transnational literature. Um, think of world literature and global literature, two terms which have, um, which are now vying for acceptance really. I mean, but, but virtually they mean the same thing. Uh, more than a dozen, dozen uh, universities are offering, offering uh, BA programs in world literature, um, throwing open the the, the, the idea of, uh, 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 I mean, absolutely exploding the idea of a canon-based uh, literary program. Now, um, I think just as uh, concepts like the translingual, the transnational, or world literature, global literature, 
you know, uh, widen the canvas. In the same way, uh, the concept of life writing widens the canvas that previously was, you know, held, say, a concept like autobiography or biography. And these were seen as, uh, you know, very uh, self-contained uh, genres, autobiography, biography, memoir, you know. Now, life writing includes all these and, and more. Now, letters, for example, they, they were there in the past. Much of Rabindranath Tagore's uh, of her, many of his books are just collections of letters and diaries. So the diary and the journal, for example, is another important mode of life writing. These have been around for centuries, but I think the act of putting them together, bringing um, them under a new uh, sort of uh, critical uh, microscope, as it were, um, it changes the picture in subtle ways. Um, now, uh, Professor Jatin Naik has uh, given us a very um, vivid and lucid uh, explanation of the different kinds of uh, tasks which are performed by autobiographies and you know, biographical writing. And uh, in this subcontinent, I think it is Historically, it's only recently that such writings have become important. I mean, if we um, look at the uh, history of uh, autobiographical writing, I think in this subcontinent, the first would be Babur's memoirs, you know, the Babur Nama, probably. Um, then uh, the biographies of uh, Humayun, uh, the, uh, the uh, biography written by uh, Gulbadan, who minds uh, a sister, I think, or oh, it's a daughter. Uh, anyway, uh, and then um, I remember Girish Karnar telling me about a fascinating uh, autobiography, the Adhakata Nayaka, which uh, it was written by a merchant, so not the kind of person who uh, would usually sit down to write a book uh, and uh, describes his uh, experiences at a time when one Mughal emperor was had died and uh, the question of succession was in dispute and there was chaos and anarchy uh, everywhere. So um, I think th these these works are, as Professor Nayak has pointed out, important. You know. These are examples of historically important documents. You know. Our understanding of the past, of those of the periods in which they were written, would be much, much poorer if these books did not exist. But uh, the rise of autobiography, uh, the rise of biography, undoubtedly is related to the uh, growth of individualism and which began um, first I think it, we would all agree in uh, Europe with the uh, Renaissance um, and so we have these um, Renaissance autobiographies in Italy um, and before that of course you have St. Augustine's uh, Confessions but uh, as we come down as we come down the centuries the number of these of these works keeps increasing. So as the middle classes grow, as individualism grows, we have a, a spike in in uh, autobiographical writings and autobiograph autobiographical writings, interestingly, have a very uh, peculiar relationship with fiction and the, the development of fiction and autobiography are uh, I think intimately related. Most many of the early novels, the, the classic novels that we teach in the uh, in any history of novel course, pretend to be autobiographies or biographies. Now, 
What is Robinson Crusoe? What is Maul Flanders? Um, what about the Journal of the Plague Year? It, it is a, 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 supposed to be a journal, but uh, Defoe was just a small boy when, when that, that plague took place. So it's actually a reconstruction, um, which reads like a reportage, but um, it can be in that sense, in, in, it can be read uh, as a novel, as a novel that gives a very accurate picture of the kind of things that happened in that, that um, uh, great uh, epidemic. And so uh, as you come down, um, in the novels pretending to be autobiographies uh, and autobiographies pretending to be novels. I think this kind, this kind of interplay uh, is an interesting aspect of the history of, of uh, you know, uh, literature. In, um, in, uh, the sub in South Asia, I think the first autobiographies that probably attracted our attention are the autobiographies of politicians. Gandhiji's autobiography, for example, uh, Nehru's autobiography. Um, but uh, if, if we restrict ourselves to Indian writing in English, and I, I would think, say that undoubtedly the first autobiography that really grabbed the attention of the uh, world readership is the autobiography of an unknown Indian. And uh, it uh, remains unique in the way it evokes East Bengali life at, in, in the early 20th century, uh, in the way it evokes uh, the Calcutta you know, um, in the early 20th century. Um, it, 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 as a as a concrete uh, record of what it felt like to live, to grow up at that time, it, it's unmatched, I think. Now, I would like to, uh, I, I, I do not want to give a kind of history of uh, life writing in, the, in South Asia, but rather, I would, uh, you know, but the title is the uses of autobiography in in, in South Asian writing. Um, I'd like to suggest that as uh, we we can uh, you know historicize, um, we can let's say uh, think of uh, periods in our literary history. You have the colonial period. Um, then the period of na nationalism and the period after 1947, the uh, post-independence. And I think now, uh, with the, in the 21st century, we're um, entering an, a, a totally new period. So I would say that if uh, Nirat Chaudhary belongs to, straddles the colonial and the post-colonial, um, and let's say after 1947, um, a, a, an autobiography like Shastri Brothers, uh, the, you know, My God Died Young, which I remember uh, I read with great pleasure as a young man, because it was also written you know, by someone who was uh, quite young when he wrote it, and uh, in its... Uh, in, in, in the sort of uh, rebelliousness that it uh, espoused, it, it uh, you know, struck, struck a chord in my you know, sensibility. Um, now, the, the age that we are now going through it is the age of post-liberalization, uh, you know, uh, the age of globalization, the age of the transnational, the age of uh, the migrant, the uh, age of translingualism. And all these are affecting the way 
I think uh, writing is shaping up. So um, I'd like to briefly uh, introduce three books, three uh, autobiographical works, all three by uh, people from Bengal, two from Bangladesh, one from uh, West Bengal, originally from West Bengal, and all three are now um, expatriates. I think one interesting development that has happened in recent year, uh, years is the uh, growing transnationality of our people. And uh, the, the every year you have a, a bigger number of people who are getting out of, of our countries. Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Um, at one time, you know, the Mughals used to say that Bengal has a thousand gates for entry and not one for departure. Um, it, because it's at one end of the subcontinent. So, and it was at one time um, frontier country because the land was uh, swampy, the land had to be slowly reclaimed, uh, which Eaton has brilliantly described in, in the rise of Islam in, on the Bengal front frontier. So the land was, the forests were cut down, the land was brought under cultivation, the population grew. Um, people came into Bengal because the land was fertile. A strange thing happened after we became independent in 1971. And soon after 71, I came back, I went back to my studies from uh, after taking part in the, in the independent war. And uh, you can imagine the state of the economy, it was in shambles after the war, and the jute market had collapsed. Before that, you see, we used to produce most of the world's jute, which was a big foreign exchange earner. And uh, we thought that, you know, we could bank on jute when we became independent. Uh, unfortunately, just as we became independent, the world uh, switched to synthetics. And uh, at, at that time, I, I could sense this uh, urge in the younger people, you see. By that time, the population pyramid, you see, uh, and the impact it would have on our lives had also become clear. It, it must be the same in the other uh, countries of South Asia as well. But each country, of course, has its own uh, peculiar characteristics. So the number of people who were, who had just become, just come of age, you know, were in, in a situation where they didn't think there was much of a future in the country because the economy was still, you know, uh, not, hadn't sh sh you know, take, taken shape. And uh, a, a popular singer, as he was just taking off, as his career was taking off, you know, um, I, a friend took me to a, an informal concert and he sang a parody of a popular Bollywood song, you know, Ham Tu Me Kamre Me Bandho which he turned into, you know, a, a song saying that you and I um, are not going to stay in Bangladesh anymore. We are going to go to America. See? And I, we all laughed up over it. But it struck me that it showed uh, the, the birth of a new uh, aspect of the collective psyche, this desire to get out of the country. And that has uh, that that has spiked over the years. And today, if you look at uh, say uh, Amitabh Ghosh's Gun Island, the number of uh, Bangladeshi uh, migrants is uh, huge. Those uh, uh, trying to cross the Mediterranean, you see, he says that the second largest number of people were from Bangladesh. So it is in this context that we have um, a, a couple of books uh, which I'd like to uh, draw your attention to. 
I, I'm pretty sure um, no one in the audience has probably seen this, these books. There's one called uh, Beloved Strangers by Maria Jodri. It's a memoir uh, published by Bloomsbury India in uh, 2014. Um, then there's another book by a Bangladeshi. She was a student of mine, well, published in 2013. And uh, the Unlikely Settler by Lipika Pelham. Um, these, these are the two Bangladeshi uh, books that I'd like to briefly discuss. And uh, from the other Bengal, you might have seen this. This is not quite not white. Losing and finding race in America by Sharmila Shen, who is a very important uh, figure in the publishing world. She is um, in the, one of the people running the Harvard University Press. Now, this was published by Penguin Viking in America in 2018. Now, and there are certain commonalities and also differences. And I think this is uh, something in life writing that is of particular interest. See? Um, when, if we write history, if we write, um, you know, a kind of an intellectual study of uh, a, of a people or a time or even uh, an individual, we tend to uh, deal. We, we tend to we fall back on abstract categories, on generalizations. You see, so we, uh, in other words, there's a kind of uh, a Procrustean bed into which we try to fit every subject we are dealing with. The beauty of life writing is that every, if it is done uh, with uh, sensitivity, each book will be unique. There will be, you know, subtleties, uh, nuances, which you will not find in another work of life writing by somebody from a, the same background you see, and from the same period. And, uh, you know, one of the things, one, one of the new concepts that uh, is gaining uh, traction in uh, academia now is intersectionalism. So, uh, I mean, the essential point being that uh, the broad categories um, are not enough to understand somebody. They intersect, and you can, you know, where exactly you be fit, you are located, you know, uh, will uh, determine the way you look at the world, etc. Now, uh, of course, the problem with intersectionalism is. Uh, Jordan Peterson pointed out is that if you pursue this logic far enough, you end up with individuals. You know, you don't find patterns, but just individuals, each with um, his or her unique experience. And I think in uh, authentic life writing, that is what we find. You know, we find the individual touch. At the same time, when we have, uh, you know. Uh, examined, relished, uh, enjoyed, um, analyzed the individual uh, experiences, then we can stand back and also see how the, the individual and the peculiar at the same time um, contain the universal, the, the general. Um, now, let me start with uh, this one uh, published in 2014. Okay. Maria Choudhury's Beloved Strangers. Um, she was born in the early 1970s. In fact, all the three writers uh, 
were born within within I think uh, ten year, ten years of each other. So this is uh, one generation, three women of one generation um, from the same part of the world with the same mother mother tongue, and uh, all three write being um, translingual writers writing in English. Now, beloved strangers, I think what's interesting is the way in which Maria is dominated, her psyche is dominated by shame and guilt. And these are aspects which are related to the culture in which she was born. And the culture, aspects of that culture, were mediated by her family background. In this case, the father was the key factor here. The book is dedicated to the father and mother and the siblings and her husband and son. Now, the father, as he is portrayed here, is a very systematic uh, man who is also very religious. And uh, very, I mean, this is not something that is very common in the uh, among the upper middle class Bengali Muslims. There is a peer, uh, a religious holy man, who is uh, whose devotees are uh, her parents, and this is an aspect of Bangladeshi or uh, South Asian Muslim culture that uh, has been written about and with modernity one would imagine that especially in a city like Dhaka and in the upper middle class uh, it would uh, not be uh, conspicuous but in some families it is and this peer is also her godfather and uh, from time to time, he visits the family, and of course, the parents bow down and uh, touch his feet. And uh, he, it's as if he was, he, he could walk in whenever he liked. And almost predictably, this is what happens when she's there in his presence. Every time I went near the peace sahib, he tried to catch of my uh, to catch hold of my hand and asked me to scratch his back. He would shout out my name and claim that he had a story to tell me about my namesake, a certain Maria Alkiptia of Egypt. Come to me, my little one, he'd repeat incessantly. Let me tell you a story about your name. I tried to hide behind my mother, but she would push me forward until I fell at his feet, touching withered yellow skin for divine, for blessings divine. Now, so, uh, because of the hold that the peer has, you know, and the father, uh, because of the, of his peculiar uh, psychic, uh, psychological weakness. You see, when he loses his job and has to then settle for a less uh, lucrative one, he suffers mentally. Eventually, has a heart attack and dies. Um, the Maria, like her elder sister, goes to America to study, and there um, the. the Another aspect, of course, of the novel is the frankness with which her uh, personal life is described. So uh, the, the, fem the uh, description of feminine sexuality, I think, in a culture like ours, is uh, a, a, a very important development that is taking place today. So um, 
one of the reasons why Taslima Nasreen got into trouble was, of course, her frankness. And the, fa the fact that she was writing in Bengali, which a larger number of people read, made her particularly vulnerable. And then eventually we know uh, how unfortunate she was and had to uh, go into exile and kind of barren exile because now she's uh, um, almost in a homeless state because even West Bengal will not have her. Um, so the the the, the uh, description of uh, uh, sexuality is frank, refreshingly frank. She uh, gets into a bad marriage in America, um, which ends in divorce. Uh, she, she comes back to Dhaka, and she marries again and moves out. So. Uh, the last time I uh, met her, she was uh, living in Hong Kong with her second husband, and so she, she has a ch child, and all sort of life has become more stable. But um, in the account, we, the, I think the most significant parts are the way she describes the, fam the tensions in the family, the the repressive nature of, of, of the society that she grows up in, her rebelliousness, and then her escape. And in America, of course, 9-11 takes place. She is called a filthy foreigner suddenly by somebody in the street. Um, she has to leave because she can't get a work visa because she, the degree she took was in religion and philosophy, and she comes back. Uh, and then goes off to Hong, Hong Kong again. So now, being transnational to her, the idea of home is not what it was to her parents or grandparents. So in one uh, uh, place she says, what is home, I snap, when somebody asks, do you think you'll ever return home? What is home? especially in this day and age. Look at this global world we live in. So I think that uh, you know, explains the situation in which this kind of writing you know, flourishes. Um, the other Bangladeshi book, Lipik by Lipika Pelham, The Unlikely Settler, again. Now, she was a student of mine, as I said. She came from a village in the in southwest Bengal, uh, her father was again religious. Her mother was more relaxed, uh, more like what traditional Bengali uh, Muslim uh, Muslims were like. You know, the culture uh, was syncretistic, and she then draws a kind of uh, dichotomy between them. So the mother, she says, represents the uh, Hindu culture of her ancestors. The father represents an austere form of Islam. I think she, she is being unfair there because if you look at the history of Islam in, um, in East Bengal, um, if, what you see before the way uh, religion entered politics after col uh, colonialism came here. What we find is what Ashish Nandi calls the uh, wonderful um, creativity, uh, the cultural creativity of Islam in India. So um, right now, for example, um, I'm uh, thinking of uh, uh, retelling in English uh, 16th century text by a Sufi called Sayyid Sultan, who wrote a massive uh, biography titled Nobi Bongsho, The Lineage of the Prophet. Um, in this, it's in two volumes, uh, the edition that has been published recently. And in that book, he, he describes not only the Prophet of Islam, but all the other prophets, 
come, who came before him. And including Hari. So Vishnu becomes a prophet in that book. Um, this is the kind of syncretism that um, existed at one time. And uh, it has now, today it would be unthinkable. But I imagine if anyone asked him why he, uh, in, in that book, he showed Vishnu as a prophet, he would have said, well, in the, the Quran, it says that God has sent uh, messengers, prophets to every people on earth. Therefore, who were here? Who were the messengers sent to the subcontinent? So the avatars of Vishnu, perhaps? So anyway, so uh, that is the kind of um, culture in which Lipika feels at home. So she des describes herself as culturally a Hindu, see? and but an atheist. So that makes her, again, if she had written this book in Bangla, um, I, I shudder to think what the reaction might have been. It was published in New York uh, by other press. And uh, I don't think it has received the kind of attention that uh, it deserves. Anyway, now in after finishing her studies at Dhaka University, she uh, went off to London to, with a job uh, in the BBC because uh, she was good at um, as a presenter, as a radio personality. So she, she got a job working for the BBC's uh, Bangla service and met a, an English guy called Leo, Leo Pelham, who is, who is Jewish. Um, now, interestingly, her husband is an English Jew who studied Arabic at Oxford and whose life's mission is to work for, to try to bring about peace in the Middle East. Um, why? Because of his, his deep-seated conviction that, you know, the uh, the Islamic and the Judaic um, communities have deep underlying uh, a, a deep kinship, which should uh, lead to um, peaceful coexistence rather than the kind of tension we have. So he, he goes to the, um, he takes his wife along because, uh, and, and she takes leave from the BBC, a long leave to accompany him with their children to live in Palestine. And he, is work, he works for a Washington based think tank and tries to make peace. So she goes from uh, you know, the all kinds of um, trips to different places where you know, he interacts with people, tries to uh, get them to agree to keep up uh, working on a peace process. So he believes that only a, a one state solution um, makes sense because unless you have one state which is not based on religion, but which is which can accommodate you know, the Jews and uh, Palestinians, uh, then you can have peace. Now the the experience of living there, and then the description of the situation there is done very well. You know, it's a, quite disturbing. Uh, Israel as a security state, and then the uh, rigid attitudes of those who have to uh, who are the uh, soldiers in the Israeli army. Um, but the experience. Uh, splits the family, you know? and for some uh, some time, the husband and wife separate, uh, although they, they are still married. Um, and even the children divide into two camps. The son becomes uh, is pro-Palestinian. The daughter uh, feels quite comfortable 
uh, describing herself as a as a, as a Jew. Um, but uh, you see, their, their, their position there is quite ambiguous because Lipika says, I'm an atheist and refuses to convert. Um, so they cannot all pass off as Jews in Israel. So at the airport, uh, um, on two occasions, she is harassed. Um, eventually, this whole experience serves to show us not only the family and the tensions that arise in the family, but those tensions reflect the family in, uh, reflect the tensions in Palestine itself, and uh, gives us a far better uh, understanding of the situation there than, uh, you know, the usual uh, socio-political study would give us. Um, in the end, they, they leave uh, Palestine. Um, the husband continues his work. He gives up the peacemaking because, in other words, the situation is hopeless and goes back to journalism, but covering the Middle East. And they are together again. Uh, and she finds peace in the attempt to write this book. Now, see the kind of uh, the differences between the two characters here. A city girl, a village girl who comes to Dhaka and then goes to England and then becomes this unlikely settler in Palestine. And through, through her life writing, we get not only her own life, her family, but also the, the uh, an entire strife-torn region in a way that is uh, uh, really uh, very vivid and uh, revealing. Uh, now, the third book, Not Quite, Not White, by Sharmila Shen, uh, she was born again uh, at about, about the same time as the other two. She was born in 1970 uh, in Calcutta to an upper middle class family, which then fell into bad times. And then the father emigrates to uh, America in 1982. They go there and then she describes how she makes a determined attempt to become American. Now, the question of color comes up. Uh, Sharmila is very fair, like her father. But her husband, who is a Sikh, is uh, darker. So are the children. So it's, an, it's interesting to how the question of color that we that is important in the subcontinent is carried over to America and it's uh, hilarious to read how Indians are categorized in America where race is an important category. And she makes the point that in India, race is not an important category. See? Uh, in fact, there's no word for race in the Indian languages. Um, but uh, in uh, America, you have the categorization, the categorization of the, uh, the population into race right from the beginning, from the very first census in 1790. Uh, white, black, and Indian meaning American Indian. Um, now, what about the South Asians? In 1970, the US Census Bureau declared people from India to be legally white. A decade later, in 1980, we were officially reclassified as Asian by the government at the insistence of Indian immigrant groups who believed that the new classification would afford us greater affirmative action benefits. But what would happen to those who had made use of the earlier decision? So now the decision was that Indians can self-report. So you 
declare what your race is. And in the 1990 census, one fourth of the Indians in America declared themselves to be white, 5% black, and the vast majority using terms that refer to South Asia. So it, I found this quite hilarious. And I was uh, amused to discover that a very well-known face in American politics, the former governor of South Carolina and the current US ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, who identifies herself as white on her voter registration card, is actually Nimrata Nikki Randhawa, daughter of Punjabi Sikh immigrants from India. Now, so this, I think the, the question of race in America dominates this book, and in, it's treated in a very, with a very light touch, a delightfully light touch. And uh, finally, now, so the question is, how do you describe yourself? Um, I think the answer that the book puts forward her answer, her solution to this problem that she faces. And the problem is summed up brilliantly by Fano, whom she quotes. Now, remember Fano describing how people would point at him in France and say, look, a Negro, that is what Fano and countless other black people say to them, uh, enslaved and colonized, say to themselves. They become visible to themselves only as a figure one sees in a distorted mirror. They cannot look out and see the world without always looking at themselves first as that reflection in the mirror. To always think of oneself in the third person, she, he, it, they, is to lose the first person, I, me, we, us. This is the condition of being hyper-visible. Imagine instead a world in which you have no words of your own to understand yourself, she says. she says. Imagine instead a world in which every word and every concept you would apply to yourself has been created by, by people who see you as inferior, as threatening, as other. Third person consciousness makes me see myself only as others see me, I become foreign to myself. Now, so she then elaborately describes how the white is the norm. You cannot call somebody white, but people are described as persons of color, uh, you know, black, brown, whatever. Now, her solution to this, the problem that Fano elaborate, you know, mentions when he says, Look, when somebody says you are a Negro, and then the Negro sees himself through the eyes of the person who had pointed at him and called him a Negro. So her answer is, uh, I would call it, her solution is an Upanishadic solution. So, which is based on negation, she says, I also know that negation carries with it a powerful note of resistance. I am not monotheist. I am not Christian. I am not European. I am not white. For all these reasons and more, I chose not white. A, a grunt, a negation, a refusal, a belligerence. And at the end, she sums up. Within the heart of non-whiteness, lies the power to name whiteness. So you are turning the tables on those who name you. The whites have named you as black or brown or yellow or a person of color. But by using the term non-white, she's affirming the power to name whiteness. By naming whiteness, I do not grant it more centrality or power. I give it shape and local habitation. 
I make it come down from its high perch of normativity and assume its rightful place among all the other colors. I contain it and domesticate it before it can contain and domesticate me and my children. I refuse to grant it the magic power of invisibility. I make it less free to move about without being stopped and frisked, without passports and visas. By naming whiteness, I do not allow it to lay its sole claim to all that we choose to call America. Now, so these are the three books, um, the out of the way books that I wanted to discuss briefly in order to uh, illustrate, I think, the ways in which today South Asians living in a globalized world can use life writing for a wide range of purposes. The purpose will vary from individual to individual. Basically, of course, life writing is writing about one's life. But as you, one writes about one's life, one brings in the whole world. And the whole world from a particular perspective. Um, everything, in fact, comes into life writing. One's genealogy, one's genetic identity, perhaps, one's social uh, position, one's uh, uh, professional life, one's personal life, one's confessional life, um, and the world as one sees, sees it. So in other words, the, uh, the concept of life writing gives us a limitless canvas on which we can, you know, uh, each do our own painting in, in a unique way. Um, in today's world, I think by focusing on life writing in the way this center and other centers are doing, um, it is possible to, to, to do a great service to the, to the literary scene because I think I, I would complain that the literary scene is dominated by the novel. Um, if you ask someone, if someone tells you uh, that he's a writer, you automatically assume that he's a novelist. And this is, I find, this is restrictive. Because, and there is a whole industry that has grown up to promote the novel as the central literary form. Uh, the the uh, writing schools, for example, um, you know, the main focus is on producing novelists, and uh, well, they have produced one uh, Nobel laureate, which is a, which is quite an achievement. But uh, Naipaul, in his book, uh, A Writer's People, uh, pointedly comments on the state of Indian writing and how you have this phenomenon of writing schools producing yes, you know, writers every year, each with one novel to produce, and after which you know, they just disappear from the scene. Um, I think genuine life writing, I personally believe, has uh, more staying power than the ordinary, the, the, than the average novel. Because the, the authentic voice of an individual will always appeal to the human sensibility uh, in any country, in any age. Today, if we discover, let's say, if we were to discover, let's say, a personal diary left by Shakespeare, just imagine how, how much uh, importance it would have. 
the resonance it would have, uh, how thrilling it would be, and how valuable uh, it would be um, to, to, to us as readers, scholars, people interested in literature. Um, I think I've come to the end of the allotted time. My, have I? Uh, uh, yes, sir. So um, there are um, a couple of questions. If you can yes. uh, take the questions now. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them has asked that is there something that will spark our passion towards life writing? Being a part Sorry? of is, is there something that will spark our passion towards life writing? One of the participants has asked because uh, she, uh, he or she has written that being a part of Gen X, I feel we have lost or become too pragmatic and lost our touch in such endeavors. Ah. I, th I think th there is a primal urge in everybody to explore the self. Um, I mean, the, in our sort of uh, role as existential beings, self-fashioning is uh, of crucial importance. And I think life writing is related to self-fashioning. Um, in, a, in a sense, the, uh, we, we are all engaging in life writing, you know, all the time. When we uh, write letters, when we write an entry in a diary, uh, we are doing life writing. The next step is to work on the uh, sort of, uh, on a kind of literary form as it were. So, it, I mean, life writing can be, you know, at one extreme, it can be automatic writing. I remember reading a book called The New Diary. It was one of these uh, books written for people who wanted to be writers and uh, who felt this, this problem that I can't write, you know, there's a block. And that whole book just... Um, details the ways in which a person can uh, break that barrier. And he said, it says uh, the, the, the simplest exercise is every day before uh, going to bed, spend some time, let's say 15 minutes, half an hour, write without thinking, some kind of automatic writing. Write whatever comes into your mind and put it away, don't read it. See? So in other words, uh, this is uh, uh, something like what Professor Nayak mentioned uh, when he uh, talked about the therapeutic aspect of uh, life writing, see? Just- So uh, one more yes. question, can a life yeah. writing be also considered similar to witness writing? I would say witness writing is a form of life writing because you see life writing is not only autobiographical it can be biographical it can be it can be reportage you know i mean uh, i think one of the um, uh, forms of life writing which had grabbed a lot of attention and which should be studied very carefully by those interested in life writing is so called new journalism in the 1960s, you see, again, uh, I think in the 20th century, two decades were crucial, you know, in uh, bringing about revolutionary changes in culture, the 1920s and the 1960s. And in the 1960s, um, there was a, a, a talk of a crisis of the novel. You know? And uh, the new journalist said, well, I mean, forget the novel, write about reality. And at that time, of course, all kinds of exciting things were happening. The Vietnam War was going on. There were student protests everywhere. Uh, social changes, dramatic social changes were taking place. And the idea behind uh, new journalism is that 
these exciting changes can be uh, written about using all the literary techniques that one can master. You don't have to worry about uh, building a plot you know, uh, as you would if you, you, you sat down to write a novel. Yes, sir. So, so one more question. Yes. Uh, just one more question. Uh, one participant has written, can sir shed some light on life writing or confessional writing reflected in South Asian poetry, especially by women poets? Yes, I think the, the first um, uh, poet one has to mention is uh, Kamala Das or Kamala Suraya. And she was writing confessional poetry at about the same time as uh, Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton. So, and she, she was doing it independently. And subsequently, I think um, now sort of confessional poetry has become a, a, a part of the mainstream. So it is no longer just a, a, a category. You know? uh, it's, it's merged into the mainstream. Um, because uh, essentially what the confessional poets did was to Break certain barriers to make it, you know it possible to deal with uh, hitherto taboo subjects, and uh, it also goes backwards. You know, say so if you um, look at the, the poems of H. D., um, there are confessional elements. Even in Robert Frost, when he writes desert places, he's writing about his uh, own depression. You see? So. Um, confessional poetry can, you know, it goes back all the way to romanticism. And uh, after the confessional poets of the late 50s and 1960s, I think it has now become uh, something that is uh, that uh, any poet can use, you know, this mode. And the same with prose, I think. Um, after the big uh, uh, changes that took place when, you know, the censorship laws were relaxed, you know, uh, Lady Chapel's lover was. Um, made available in it was 1963. Yeah. You remember this poem by Larkin uh, uh, when the about the, the Chatterley being allowed to be published. So um, from the that period onwards, you see, as uh, in the West, uh, censorship has really died. You know, it's no longer uh, something writers need to worry about. I think uh, now the whether one is writing in writing prose or poetry, the confessional is just part of the mainstream. So it's up to the, the writer to decide what exactly you know what uh, one's own uh, approach to writing will be. In our culture, I think there are problems. You know, so uh, I mean the experience of Salman Rushdie, the experience of Tasnim Nasreen. Then the uh, experience of uh, Aubrey Menon's the Ramana, which is still under a ban in India, you know the Rama retold. You know, um, so in uh, third world cultures, there still is a problem, and with uh, uh, radicalism, you know, this problem can impact on the first world also, as you know from the terrorist attacks. So these are um, aspects of our uh, social political life, um, which are unfortunately present. And uh, the writers have to negotiate their way through this minefield, as it were. I mean, uh, it, it's a, uh, very depressing. It can be a very depressing situation. Thank you, sir. It was a very interesting session. Thank you for your erudite talk on the uses of life writing for South Asians. And we are grateful to you, sir, for sparing your precious time to be with us and talk to us. We have a break now. Uh, let's meet again at 1.30 for the